I mean, this is our child's future. Why wouldn't we get involved? In fact, if you don't get involved or are too passive, you're seen as somebody that doesn't care. So I've heard of the term helicopter parenting before, and I recently came across a brand new term called snowplow parenting which essentially is about removing every single obstacle and frustration out of your child's way as a way to help them towards success. So the term snowplow parenting has been coined by the New York Times in a recent article that they wrote called How Parents Are Robbing Their Children of Adulthood. It describes the situation as it starts early, when parents get on wait lists for elite preschools before their babies are born, and try to make sure their toddlers are never compelled to do anything that may frustrate them. It gets more intense when school starts, running a forgotten assignment to school, or calling a coach to request their child to make their team. I just wanna stop there and say it is so easy to get caught up in this frenzy. When we think about our kids, of course we want the best for our kids. And I will be the first one to say and raise my hand that I'm 100% guilty of this. There are so many times where I have looked into different programs and I started freaking out about, you know, what will it take to get my son into this program? What do I need to do? Who do I need to contact? What kind of, you know, activities do I need to do in order to get him ready? And I think it's really easy to get caught up and get carried away with this. If you are a parent in the Brooklyn or Manhattan area, I think you will completely relate to what the situation with the whole entire school system is there. In fact, let me demonstrate. So it might be no brainer to you, but New York City is a high density city. Last time I checked on the New York State government website, there are 1.1 million students from kindergarten to grade 12 and only 1,840 public schools to take them. So that statistic alone is already quite a lot of competition to try to get your kid into school. But not all schools are created equal. Schools in the New York and Brooklyn area, just like any other town across the US, is graded based on student performance and proficiency in English and math. With some schools having very low scores, meaning the kids aren't passing even the most basic and fundamental levels of reading and math, these websites become a barometer to understand where are the best schools to send your kid so they get at least a decent education. So naturally, as any good parent would do, you start evaluating these schools, you make lists, and you fall in love with a couple of them. But only to realize that they accept a small percentage of students, with most schools requiring that you live within that specific zone to meet their criteria. And let me tell you, the zones of eligibility for these schools are incredibly small with some only consisting of a couple of street blocks. So it's not totally uncommon for parents to start to look into how they can get into these neighborhoods by researching on apartments and homes to make sure that they qualify to be eligible to get into that school zoning district. And for some, money is no object, where people buy into multi-million dollar properties just so they can get their kid into the right school. And then it's totally common for the school district to change the zone on you which means if you live even half a block outside the zone, your child is disqualified from being able to attend that school. So if that wasn't enough to put you off, there's actually more. There are some highly rated schools in the New York City and Brooklyn area that have so much competition and so little spots that the only point of entry to get into them is through kindergarten. That means pre-kindergarten, when your child is between the ages of three and four, they have to be tested to make sure that they even are qualified and are considered smart enough to get in. So some of those overzealous parents, such as myself, begin to work backwards very early point on in their journey. So for me, that meant when my son was about nine months old and I started doing all this research, I already started planning all his curriculum and understanding what is it at this stage that I can start teaching him now to start prepping him for these pre-K tests. As I started getting further down into this rabbit hole of research, 
I started discovering that there are test prep consultants you can hire. There's a whole lot of different products out there on the market just aimed at getting toddlers to learn different skills and curriculum to make sure that they're acing these tests. And if that wasn't enough, there are admission services counselors that you can hire that help you navigate through all this process just to get your kid into kindergarten. I will say this entire experience actually pushed me into snowplow parenting danger zone. I became so overbearing and so pushy that it actually made some people question my morale. I mean, I would say the whole reason parents strive to get their child into even the best kindergarten is because they're thinking about the future ahead. The thought is, if they go to a bad school now, what's going to happen later on? They're not going to get into the right elementary school. They're not going to get into the right middle school. They're not going to get into the right high school, which means they will not get into the right college, which means their entire life will be ruined. So when it comes to this term of snowplow parenting, I truly believe that parents mean well and that we just want our kid to succeed and we want the best for them. We want them to come out better than we did. I know, for instance, as I started reflecting on this and how crazy I was starting to act about thinking of how I need to start, you know, pre-testing him and what is the curriculum that I need to set up for him in order to set him up for success so he gets into the best schools. Even these flashcards, uh, the idea of gifted testing is crazy. I think every kid is gifted in some sort of manner, whereas today we have so much choice and so much availability that we sort of get anxious of whether our child is going to go to the right school and then get into the right program and are they going to meet the right people and be surrounded by, you know, the right crowd. I mean, this is our child's future. Why wouldn't we get involved? In fact, if you don't get involved or are too passive, you're seen as somebody that doesn't care. And I think we all get caught up in this, but when we start to really sort of dive in is it stems from our own anxiety. We feel anxious about our child not su succeeding or not doing well, especially with all these things that we hear in the world of, you know, how much more difficult it's going to be, how much more competitive it's going to be to get the right job and, you know, get into the right school. So we really get caught up in this and it makes me sort of think about what is the right thing for the future generation. And as I started to research this topic a little bit, more it made me realize that actually getting over involved is really hurting our kids so the former dean of freshmen at stanford who's also quoted in this article says at stanford she said she saw students rely on their parents to set up play dates with people in their dorm or complain to their child employer when an internship didn't lead to a job the root cause she says was parents who had never let their children make mistakes or face challenges. Ah, the idea of our children facing challenges. So I think this sort of stems from a really early point when we even have babies. And maybe it's a millennial thing, I don't know. But there's this idea that, for instance, we sort of want to get over involved and anything that has to do with pain or, or the feeling of uh, negativity, we don't really want to deal with. An example of this, for instance, would be is I was on a three month maternity leave and when Valentino was three months old, I really needed to sleep train him because I was going back to work. So the idea of making my child cry it out, obviously controlled tr crying is the method that we used, seemed crazy to me and it's not something that I wanted to face or deal with. I felt like I was torturing my child. But we eventually went through with it because I needed to go back to work. And so the idea of spending sleepless nights trying to coddle him back to bed isn't, was not going to work out for us. And it's just something that I was forced into the situation of this is something that we need to do. But when I think about it actually benefited us in the end because one of the things that I kept in my mind is if I sleep train him. I'm going to teach him the independent skills to be able to put him back to sleep or be able to soothe himself back to sleep. And I know not everybody believes in this, but this is something that really worked for us. And I think from about month three, uh, you know, give or take a month, it 
after we sleep trained Valentino, we've had wonderful, you know, 12 hour nights where my husband and I were able to get rest. Uh, people were able to go to work, function, and be the parents, the kind of parents that we want to be during the day. If we didn't do that, if we didn't teach him those independent skills, I think we would have been in a very different place. And I sort of take this to heart as I start thinking about this idea of snowplow parenting and how it even stems into the little things that happen throughout our daily routines. So Valentino now is a year and a half and he's about 18 months and this idea of being super mindful about not trying to do too much for him and trying to control or solve too many challenges for him uh, is something that I'm being really mindful but I will say it is not the easiest thing. So some examples for instance is when he is playing with a puzzle or he has opened something or something is stuck it's so easy for me to just jump in and do it for him and I've been trying to be much more patient about giving him the time and allowing him to figure things out on his own. And this may seem really silly, but there is this idea that if I solve this for him, he's never going to learn how to do it himself. But as I learn more and I know more, about the idea that if I do get overtly involved and I do sort of, you know, solve too many things for him, this idea that I'm actually not helping him out in the end, being conscious of that is allowing me to actually step back and give him room and let him face challenges and sort of obstacles in order to be able to learn some of these skill sets. And as I start to think about that, that by me doing that, I'm actually helping him out in the end. And if I think about it, that is what I wanted for him in the first place. Mm -hmm.